Hello, everyone. Welcome to J3 of Quantum Latino. We have great sessions lined up for today, but now is the time for our first talk on J3 by one of our co-organizers of Quantum Latino, Professor Salvador Vanega Sindraka. He is currently Associate Head of the Computer Science Department at Technology de Montreal and is also founder of the Con Unconventional Computing Lab. His work is focused on understanding all scientific and societal aspects of computation, as well as on contributing towards the economic development of modern society based on science and technology. He is a leading scientist in the field of quantum works, co-founder of the field quantum image processing, and is also founder of quantum computing in Mexico. He is a fellow of the Mexican Academy of Sciences, senior member of the Association for Computing Machinery, Fellow of Mexican Academy of Computer Science, member of Mexican Society for Public Communication of Science, and SNI level of two at Mexico's National Network of Researchers. As you all know, he's an icon in quantum in Latin America and beyond. Over to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Manita. Thanks a lot. Um, hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I think that, well, th this talk is basically about uh, how to write uh, scientific papers. So it, that's, um, you see, that's a huge topic. Um, in which many of us, uh, I mean, uh, all of you, if you compose the audience, surely have different, uh, say, um, um, <clears throat> uh, levels of maturity of understanding how to write a scientific paper. So I think that the best um, way to conduct this uh, this session is by listening to your questions. I'll, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll have um, a brief introduction of what I think is. Uh, uh, the process of writing a good scientific paper is, but the um, you know the, the the richest part of this will come from the questions you actually pose, because um, this otherwise talking about how to write a scientific, a scientific paper is like talking about how to swim or how to work out at the gym. It's all right, but at some point it gets boring because uh, um, see because what what really matters there are the questions that people have about how exactly or to be very good at swimming. Very good at working now. How to get the most out of our uh, of our time at the gym, and it's exactly the same for a scientific paper. See the questions that uh, that we have when writing a paper. Those that come say to our minds at three o'clock in the morning and say, "Well, now what exactly should I do now for uh, uh for com well for communicating good science?" That's the first thing, and also for convincing the referees that my paper is worth being published. Okay, and along that sense, I can tell you that I've written a number of papers uh, so far in, in, in my life. Uh, the first papers, I would say the first five papers were quite difficult for me to write, not because of the process of writing itself, but because I I didn't have all the say all the tools, all the tricks. If um, if I were to use that expression, I mean tricks in a good sense. Okay? So all the things that we need to understand, what would we call um, the tools of the trade, yeah, um, uh, to write papers and then you know, as an extension to write scientific books. Um, so please feel, uh, please feel free to write your questions. I don't see any, so it would be great to have as many questions as you can actually pose right now. I, I yeah, well, okay, so go ahead. And then meanwhile, I'll tell you um, the way I see how to write a good scientific paper. The very first thing that we need to have uh, in order to write a good scientific paper, is a good scientific idea. That com and, and that's kind of obvious. As a matter of fact, many of the steps that will lead us to write uh, good science are kind of obvious in the sense that, uh, pretty much in the sense that, uh, uh, that uh, looking backward, backwards, you know, uh, you know, the mistakes and the uh, and the, uh, um, the triumphs and the failures that we have had seem to be obvious. Eh? Well, yeah, of course, it's, it should be clear that in, in order to write a good paper, first of all, we need to have a good scientific idea to share. But that's not necessarily the case because of the pressure that you know that uh, academia and the academic industry exerts on scientists, and that's something that has to be really taken into account. Back in the beginning of the of the 20th century. Um, which is for many people pretty much sort of a um, 
say the paradigm, the scientific paradigm uh, from which the, we, many of us actually chose to, to become scientists because of this uh, romantic, uh, idealist uh, uh, position towards uh, uh, creating new knowledge, understanding uh, the very basic forces of nature uh, by basically by means of a grand tour of pure um, rational thought, uh, rational force. Um, that world, that of the very first, say, 25 years of the 20th century, I'm not a speaker of previous times in the 19th century. Well, science and the scientific communities and the way that science was conducted and financed and founded uh, um, yeah, and financed, was very different from the way we do science now. Funded, that's what I was looking for, sorry. And the way that science was funded um, was very different from the way it is now. Uh, back in those days, um, basically people uh, did research pretty much at their own expenses. Um, there was, of course, you know, for those who were privileged enough to work for uh, uh, big universities like Oxford, Cambridge in the United Kingdom and uh, other European universities that were the kind, um, where they did have at least the facilities, uh, sometimes rather modest, but they did have facilities for for doing scientific research. Uh, but then you see the money that, that, that was needed to, to conduct such activities came from, uh, from private hands. Uh, in, in the United Kingdom, which is the story that I know very well as well as that of my country, in the United Kingdom, um, uh, research, for example, on astronomy uh, was funded by the government, but because um, basically because they needed some very practical tools for navigating, right? uh, remember that uh, the well, England at that time was basically expanding as, a, as an empire all over the world, and they needed tools in order to <clears throat> take their ships uh, uh, to other continents to do trade, which was the very basis of the uh, and the, a very particular characteristic of the British Empire. So they funded uh, uh, the uh, research and having observatories, etc. Maybe because there was some interest in, in science itself uh, from members of the Crown, but it was mainly because they needed some practical, very practical tools um, uh, to do business and to expand the empire. So that's the way uh, 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 that used to work in the in, in those days. Meaning there was no, uh, there was not a systematic uh, funding method or procedure, process methodology uh, for having the big machinery of science that was required. Uh, to discover many things at that time, people didn't even know they existed. But then uh, I would say that the big change uh, in terms of the um, in terms of the way we, we think of science and we do science, and therefore the way we uh, communicate our results came with the Second World War. Because the, the Second World War meant a huge, uh, say, um, um, uh, starting point for what we know now as modern science. First of all, because the, the, the very term big science, I meaning that that was conducted uh, mainly with uh, industrial methods, um, uh, became plentiful uh, just immediately after, well, during the Second World War and immediately after that. And then also because the uh, you know, science became an industry. Uh, people realized, I meaning governments, universities, uh, scientists themselves, realized that uh, in order to well, to keep on doing science and to grow you know, the community was required to discover many things. Uh, the idea of doing it by only by say uh, with a romantic view and with a with a kind of funding, the way that science was funded was not enough. So basically, what happened? Uh, well, and it was mainly in the um, in Europe and the United States. Uh, science became a branch of industry. What we produce in science in academia. Is knowledge. Well, what we produce in science, either in academia or industry, is knowledge. The news is usually very much applied, although there are many cases uh, like that of IBM in which fundamental science is produced and uh, <clears throat> and then later on applied. But you see that now, the point that I want to make with this uh, the short introduction to, uh, to the history of science and the way we do science is that, um, uh, for example, the languages we use uh, the, to communicate science now, which is mainly English, you say 95 percent uh, of all scientific articles are written in English. Although there are some uh, local societies, like for example, the um, the Mexican Physical Society it has two journals, and we can publish either in Spanish or English. But the truth is, 
that if we want to have uh, um, an impact on the international scientific community, the very first, first thing that one has to realize is that uh, speaking English and writing English, writing good English is fundamental. <clears throat> Otherwise, our, uh, our impact is going to be quite limited. Um, just a few, to a few local uh, journals that hopefully will have an impact at the national level. But science is an international um, activity by definition. See, so the development of science, the development of ideas, um, and the use of, of those ideas for understanding nature and then for uh, producing industrial goods, either products or services, uh, is a process that can be done anywhere in the world. Um, okay, so going back to the fundamentals of how to write a scientific paper, first thing to remember is we have a good scientific idea, and that's difficult. That's very difficult because, um, I mean, seasoned scientists like myself, for, for example, we know that uh, producing a good scientific idea uh, takes time, requires patience, sometimes requires uh, quite a big tolerance to frustration um, because um, uh, there are the properties that a good scientific idea has to have uh, are, uh, are difficult to achieve. For example, it has to be, uh, that idea has to be clearly described one must have a goal in mind. That goal in mind can be either, you know, uh, describing in the case of a, a fundamental scientific research, can be discovering, say, a new property of nature, or it could also be a particular application of science, which is right, right at the borderlines of science and engineering, like, for example, as it is, as it is the case in computer vision, in which uh, a published paper, with a paper, sorry, with a, with a very particular scientific goal in mind, or engineering goal in mind, um, and then we basically, um, uh, the activities that are carried out in order to reach that goal are different, um, uh, say, in nature and in purpose than those used for discovering fundamental properties of nature. <clears throat> okay, well, so, but the, the thing is that depending on the field that we are uh, working on, one has to be able to uh, define, to write a good scientific idea. And then once that is done, um, we need to have a team to work on it. Okay? And well, sometimes you know, at the very beginning of our careers, it's usually ourselves. As a, for example, as PhD students, we have to work it out uh, by ourselves and then uh, show that our ideas are worth uh, 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 the work, the effort, and the and funding. Uh, um, but then the point is that uh, the, either uh, by ourselves or with a team, uh, we become uh, uh, PIs, etc then we have to think of the method that is to be used for taking that idea into something more tangible. This is very much like the way it goes for, uh, say, uh, for going from one uh, conception, from one idea, from one notion into a product. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, the process that is to be carried out is, I'll answer to your question in a sec. Thank you very much, Christian. The process that is to be, to be carried out with that, that goes you know, to go from one idea to not necessarily to a paper because we haven't reached that point yet, but to the point of having um, um, found something interesting to communicate uh, is basically the same process of, of uh, that consists of uh, uh, of designing a innovative method and then implementing it, so a strategy and implementation. That process, which is very well known, for example, to CEOs, to people who are very successful at um, um, uh, leading companies, that is having a strategy and then the definition of the strategy by itself uh, allows to understand the way we're going to implement that idea, that the strategy. That's pretty much the way it goes. Uh, I mean, it goes exactly very much along the same lines for scientific research to go from one idea into something that is worth being communicated. Uh, we have to think of the strategy but simultaneously um, <clears throat> we must think of how we're going to make that strategy happen in reality. That's, then I have to say that, in my opinion, this process of, yeah, of thinking in parallel of a strategy and implementation is something that, I mean, it's a process which is quite well known in the, in the scientific world that, I, that I'm a member of, and in particular in the United States and the United Kingdom, and of course, Germany, and many other places, countries that are... Uh, well advanced in, in scientific research. Uh, but that process of thinking in parallel or with the strategy and implementation is not that natural, at least in my country. 
uh, in Mexico, uh, people think of a strategy in general. Right? It's not only science, but it's uh, in politics. Oof, if I told you what I think about it, uh, in, in politics, in business, people think of a strategy and implementation as two different things. And that's, I mean, that's of course work. Right? Uh, anyone who's actually read, uh, made some basic reading on, on business strategy knows very well that this is, this is just work. But the point is that it seems to be sort of a, like, like a cultural property uh, of, our, uh, of our societies to think of defining the strategy first and then think of the implementation secondly. I know, that's wrong. We have to think of them in parallel. So when we do that in science, okay, we can actually uh, have a good estimate uh, of the amount of time that we're going to need to go from an idea to something which is worth communicating. We're going to have also a good estimate of the financial and the human talent resources that we shall require to do that, to make that happen. Okay? And that's crucial, that's fundamental, you see, because in the end, science is, is such a beautiful activity that many of us decided to devote our lives to it or to her. But being in love with science is not enough to make it a profession. We really have to think of the financial resources that we need, or the human talent that we need, and the ambitions and goals that the human talent is going to work with us also have. You see? If one has a PhD student, that PhD student is to finish his or her um, in, uh, research and to get to the uh, corresponding degree. It, depending on the place, it could be so from between four and seven years. Uh, seven is quite a lot, let's say four or five. Um, and, um, and the responsibility of, of making that happen is shared by the supervisor and the student himself or herself. So a good estimate of the amount of time that the students will have to invest, the graduate students in particular, will have to invest in, in the piece of research uh, that we would like to carry out, okay? together with the money that we're going to need, the facilities, is really, I mean, that's really the, the main responsibility or one of the main responsibilities of a PI. So having a good idea of that, a good estimate of the resources that we shall need is fundamental. Right? And then we carry it out, we do that. And when we get to the point of having something worth being communicated, then the process uh, of discovery um, uh, you know, uh, starts to give some place or time uh, um, to the um, uh, to the process of writing a document in which we shall communicate what we have found. Now, um, before I go on, let me answer a question by um, Christian Susser. What is the most important and perhaps difficult part of writing a paper? Any recipe to write a motivated and unique intro when? Oh, I shall answer that in a sec. Thank you very much. Um, Alberto Cordova asks, my, Hi, Professor, my questions are, could one write and publish a scientific paper as an independent researcher without being represented by an institute or company? Under this way, is it safe to copyright respectively? Uh, I, that's a really good question. And then he says, um, I only have ORCID, yeah? And I don't know if this is one of the minimum requirements for any scientific article publishing. Many things. Well, I think that, um, well, I'll answer both questions, but let me start with, uh, uh, with that of um, uh, Alberto. Um, well, the first question, could I write, could one sorry, write and publish a scientific paper as an independent researcher without being represented by an institute or a company? The answer is definitely yes. Yes, you certainly can. And if you're in that position, um, uh, hopefully you will. And why do I say hopefully? Because the, pro the main problem that you shall face uh, is, is basically that of resources, money and time. That's going to be the, 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 the most difficult part of doing scientific research and uh, writing a paper, because that's something unavoidable. It takes time. There are, um, say, some um, um, methodologies that we may use you know, to speed up uh, the process of discovery and, and writing scientific papers. But no matter how, I mean, in, in my opinion, in my experience, you know, the I mean, that process takes time, not only because of the, say, of the very nature of human activities, but the way we carry out the stuff, but it's also because, you know, uh, finding something interesting uh, is not necessarily um, something that happens Im just immediately after having defined an idea and having started to implement the strategy, you know, to carry out the method. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Uh, when I was working on, on my PhD, um, the very first idea that I uh, 
that I had in mind eh, to, to start with, uh, uh, doing scientific discovery and then um, writing a paper. Um, we happened to produce, I mean, in the end, the, that idea that took about uh, three months to go you know, from the very conception uh, to the point where I realized that I was in, it's, it's I, I, just about, I was just about to say shit, but I, I shall not. <laughs> but I got to the point of realizing that, that what I was doing was not exactly right, that I needed to change the, uh, the approach that I was, uh, that I was using. Uh, it took me three months to, you know, to go from what point, from the beginning to that point. Basically, what happened is that I thought of a quantum um, algorithm um, that would allow me to do, that would allow us to do some uh, um, processes, some um, image processing techniques that would allow us to implement some image processing techniques in a quantum computer or a quantum system. But then I, I mean, in the beginning, I was really hopeful that that process would actually be lead us you know, to have a speed up uh, in the way that we would uh, uh, be able to store and process images in a, in a quantum system. But then I realized that no, that, that it wasn't true. Uh, it was not necessarily true. And then I, I came, I came to realize that because the uh, I spent two months working on the mathematics of the problem, and then I just couldn't solve, you know, as a, basically a set of inequalities. I just couldn't find a solution set. Um, so I spoke to my former supervisor, to Professor Sugar uh, He worked it out himself, and he came to me saying, "Well, you know." I think that your idea is wrong, basically. <laughs> and he was right, my idea was wrong. But it took, um, well, it took three months, but you know, it, it wasn't that these three months were uh, a waste of time, they were not, because I learned a lot from that experience, but I certainly didn't get a paper from that. Okay? So that happens, right? It, it, and it happens to everyone, even to citizen scientists. Sometimes we have ideas that we think are gonna take us right into a major discovery, or, I don't know, so. It happens that it may not necessarily be the case. So, going back to your question, um, um, that process of uh, scientific discovery and writing, since that takes time, and therefore it takes uh, resources, financial, um, even emotional resources. You see, the, the process of uh, fighting against uh, uh, frustration is, is uh, uh, very consuming. It's very, I'd say, heart consuming. Um, that I think is going to be is going to be the main uh, obstacle that you shall be facing if you work as an independent researcher, because uh, when working for a company or a university, uh, since one is expected, well, if you're working, say, for example, for a, a scientific um, uh, research center uh, at a company or, of course, at the university, uh, you're expected to do research, and since you're expected to do research uh, as a collaborator to that organization. Uh, you have to be provided the, you know, the tools that you need to do that. Um, in a university, well, you basically have to get your own tools, you know, get your own money, funding, and blah, blah, blah. There will be facilities, there will be uh, graduate programs that you can attract students to, you see. So it's, um, uh, universities and companies are basically, um, uh, let me put it this way, in, in the sense that we are, uh, in the sense of this part of my talk, uh, universities and companies, the that work on research um, basically are kind of providers you know, of, of different elements that allows us researchers to focus on the things that we want to work on and uh, um, and therefore to be more efficient at producing, uh, producing new knowledge. But indeed, if you have the time uh, and the will and the financial means uh, to do research as an independent uh, uh, scientist, you can certainly do. There will be no opposition at all uh, from a scientific journal to publish your paper. It will be quite a, a typical. That's true, but I can tell you as an I am an associate editor to QIP, um, and I, I've never come across you know, a paper published by an independent researcher. But when I do, which will eventually happen, uh, I shall have no trouble of at all of sending that paper to peer review if it's worth being sent to peer review and eventually to publish it if it's uh, yeah, uh, if it you know if it's approved you know, by the peer review uh, system so the answer is yes you can do it but taking uh, uh, take into account keep in mind 
that is going to be um, a, a, a difficult process because of what I just said, because of the resources that you need to invest. Now, as for the copyright, well, any, uh, any piece of intellectual property has two different sets of rights. Uh, the first set of rights is that, uh, which is known as, uh, as uh, I can't recall whether how you say it in English because I learned it in Spanish, but in Spanish we would call it paternidad, we would be parenthood, or maybe, yeah, I think that's the right word. Uh, the, the, the technical, the right technical word used to refer to this, uh, to this first set of rights uh, of an intellectual property, in intellectual property, which is um, going, uh, let, me, let me be concrete. Um, if you produce a paper, then that paper um, and the relationship that you have with that paper can be expressed uh, by different uh, rights. The first right that you have to be aware of is that of uh, you being uh, always uh, able to be named, to be recognized as the author or co-author, depending on, of that paper, of that manuscript, okay? So that right, which is what I mean by, you know, by this uh, loose translation of parenthood right, um, shall always be yours. It doesn't matter what happens, it doesn't matter who publishes that paper, it doesn't matter if it's never published or if it's become, if it becomes, well, whatever happens to that paper, you have the right to be recognized as the author of it, okay? That's one thing. Now, the other set of rights is, uh, and, and that's why when publishing a paper in a, in, in a journal, the names of the authors shall always be there, okay? Now, the other set of rights that you have to be aware of uh, of any piece of intellectual property that you produce is that of uh, basically the, the rights that allows an individual or an organization to commercialize that product. Okay? So what happens when writing a paper and then sending it off to a publishing company, if the paper gets published, then in the traditional publishing method, then the author shall have to transfer the rights of commercializing that piece of paper, okay, uh to the publishing company and the copyright uh comes along that way because um um basically what will the company and that and this this what i'm just about to say uh has been quite uh i mean the rules of what i'm just about to say have relaxed a lot over the last let say five to seven years um uh, which is that um say but 20 uh, 10 years ago and even now with just a, a few uh with some publishing companies there are some severe restrictions as for being able or unable to share the scientific articles that are published in, a, in, in, in those journals. For instance, there are, there are uh, publishing companies uh, whose journals, when accepting a paper, they say, well, the, uh, you know, the, the version of the paper that has been published by the company, uh, by, the, by, the, by the publishing company, by the journal, that is to say, the version of the paper that has you know, the definite, the, the very last, um, uh, edition of this, the very words that are used in the final version, together with the uh, 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 with the art design, with the artwork, uh, with the logo of the company, and the blah blah, and all the elements that come together in a published paper. Well, what some uh, publishing companies shall say well will be well. This is the paper that we have published you know, for you uh, after the peer review process, and. This paper, I mean, as it is now with the, with the artwork and all the stuff, cannot be shared for a certain amount of time. It can only be bought um, or rented, depending on, um, from the publishing company. So some companies have, this is called the veto uh, right, and some companies have it for one year. So what happens after that year is that one would be, well, not, not totally free to share the paper with you, the food with the public archive. But then, uh, but then one would be able to, to share the answer more freely. Now, keep in mind that I just referred to the, uh, you know, the very definite version, published version of that paper, okay? With the logo of the company and all the stuff. But we can certainly, nowadays, and this is something that happens you know, on a regular basis every day in physics and uh, some branches of computer science, mathematics and you know, a lot of branches of science and engineering, um, one can uh, actually um, upload a preprint version of our papers to public repositories. In the case of uh, physics and computer science, and particularly in one computation, the archive, uh, A-R-X-I-V, as in void, dot O-R-G, archive.org, is the public repository that many of us use for, um, um, for our pre, for the 
preprint versions of our papers. Now, the difference between a preprint version and a published version of a paper can be just a few or can be many, depending on, on, the, on the commitment of the researcher to, to share um, the uh, knowledge on a sort of a kind of a free basis for the preprint version. But certainly, you, we cannot upload the definite published version of a paper in a public repository. We shouldn't. But something that we can certainly do is to upload a preprint version, which uh, whose main difference with the published version could be just the, the artwork, for instance. Okay. So there are different procedures that we follow depending on the um, uh, um, on the publishing company or the editorial company, depending on the particular policies that the journal has. So um, one has to read very carefully uh, you know, those policies before uh, signing any paper. But I would say that pretty much you see that in general, generally speaking, uh, the transfer of rights from an author to company, to a publishing company, shall consist of A, the um, uh, the right to commercialize a paper, um, and B, uh, the, um, the possibility of sharing that paper, that particular, again, I insist, uh, definite published version of the paper with others, okay? That'll be it. And that's something that you have to do, um, meaning as an author, um, no matter, I would say that this is something that happens uh, regardless of one works for a company or a, or a university. The only exception I know of, uh, that I'm aware of, is that of scientists working for uh, governments who are who in, that invest that heavily invest in scientific research like the um uh, the united states of america or the united kingdom because i've seen in the publishing agreements that one is asked whether one is a member or what works for example for the uh for the u.s army or u.s air force or equivalent uh, organizations in the united kingdom but since i've never worked for them uh, i've done research with them but i've never worked for those organizations I really don't know what the uh, what the particular uh, uh, trade-off is there. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for the question. And then now let me get to Christian's question. What is the most important and perhaps difficult part when writing a paper? Mm. Good point. The answer will depend on who you ask. But for me, the most difficult part is that I hate to make mistakes. So uh, I really, uh, even though I know that I make mis mistakes and that's unavoidable and it's human nature, I, I'm, I'm obsessive with my papers uh, to make sure that question, the, the, the questions are perfectly well and that you know the way we have written and expressed our ideas are clear enough um, so yeah, that's the most difficult part for me because I can you know, iterate over and over one, two, three my iterations to the point that I say, well, enough. <laughs> we really have to submit this paper because I cannot find anything else to change. Uh, well, to improve, there's certainly always room to improve. But um, that's that other part, which is quite difficult for me to realize that at some point that, I mean, th there is a certain amount of knowledge that we can share in a paper and that if we want to share more, maybe it would be a good idea to write two papers instead of one. Okay? Not be, not only because the way it is, you know, the scientific, uh, uh, the way the, we scientists are measured, which is by the number of papers and the quality of them, but it's also because um, uh, you see, a paper is written so that others read it. Not, I mean, that paper is not to be read by the authors, but by others, and. I mean, that's something obvious, but the point that I want to make is that if one writes a very long paper with many ideas in it, instead of having only one contribution or maybe two contributions per paper, then reading that paper is going to become really difficult. And what will eventually happen will be that uh, many people just shall not read it simply because they don't have time to read 60 pages. Instead of reading, uh, instead of choosing from, say, six articles or five, uh, you know, so the, but the very particular ideas and contributions that are uh, that are presented in each one of those papers. So I'm making up my mind as to when I have to stop um, um, uh, working on on, on, this, on the new knowledge that I would like to that I would like to present in a paper, and then having a strategy 
was saying, well, as for all these projects, well, that's something that's happening to me right now. Uh, we got this huge, uh, well, hopefully we've gone huge, but now it, it's becoming really big uh, uh, research area in my, in my group, which is um, now working on biological data, um, analyzing biological data using quantum algorithms, which is the work I've been, uh, I've been privileged enough to be doing with, uh, uh, with Diego Santiago Alarcón and, um, and, and Hector Mejia. Um, making of our minds uh, to the saying, well, this piece of paper goes, this, this piece of knowledge goes in this paper, and this goes in another paper, blah, blah, and being able to connect these papers as a, as a collective sum of ideas that express strategically, strategically, sorry, in several papers so that they can be communicated efficiently, that's difficult to do. Okay, that's difficult to do. Um, I would say that these are the two most difficult parts for me. Um, now, the most enjoyable part of writing a paper is having something worth being communicated. Uh, when I get to the point to say, yeah, that piece of paper, that piece of knowledge, I think that people are going to enjoy it, they're going to like it, it's going to contribute uh, to, the, um, to the advancement of understanding a particular field. That's the best part of it. And then writing it down, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit frustrating sometimes when one is working on a paragraph and after two hours, the, the paragraph is, is still is not clear enough, you know, uh, uh, for my standards uh, to go to the next idea and keep on working. Yeah, that's a bit difficult, but it's not really uh, you know, the worst part of it. I would say it's just part of the process that one has to carry out and, uh, well, and that's worth the effort. So that would be my answer, Christian. If you have more questions, please feel free to, to carry on. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the uh, Alberto. Yeah, that's exactly the, the, the repository that I mentioned, archive.org. Okay, so well going back to the uh, to this point, I I, I stop uh, before answering the questions uh, by saying that we have an idea, then we go to uh, uh, through the strategic and implementation processes of uh, having something worth communicating it. And once we get to the point of having a, uh, say a reasonable piece of new knowledge that we like to share, then writing the paper, um, so I would say that it's, uh, it's both uh, a science and an art. Okay? We need, uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, on the one hand, one has to be aware of the, uh, before, before writing, uh, before embarking into the process of writing a paper, one has to be able, at least that's what I do, um, to write you know, in, a, in a text file okay? the main idea that I would like to communicate shortly in one paragraph, okay? to have it clear, what I want to say. Because by defining what I want to say, I also define what I do not want to say. Okay, And being focused is a fundamental component of writing a good scientific article. So that's one thing. Once I get that, then Basically, the process is like um, th that's when it becomes an art because, at least for to me, uh, because the next step will be uh, to well, what I do, people have different strategies, but what I do when I write a paper is uh, I start writing, I start working on the, on the contribution part of this paper. So, usually, a paper is composed of an introduction, well, first of all, an, an abstract, which is a summary of the, uh, of the work that we did and the contribution that one is presenting to. In that paper, then the, the next session will always be an introduction, then the contribution, conclusions. Some people include future work; that's optional. And um, and sometimes it is not a good idea because you see future work is the stuff we're going to be working on over the next few months or years. And um, uh, and then uh, and then the references. Okay, so um, I start working on the uh, on the contribution because this is the part that the it takes way longer to me uh, to write in a in a clear fashion. Okay? It, it, being very clear, concise, in good English, uh, um, and to, to, by means of those standards, to write a contribution that we would like to present in a paper. That takes time. Okay, so um, if it takes time to you too, uh, first of all, be aware that you're not alone. Uh, it takes time to everyone. Right? It's a lengthy process, and uh, and B, every single second and minute that we invest on 
clearly communicating our contribution to our peers and society in general is really worth, okay? So um, don't hurry up if you don't have to. Right? Take your time to whatever you have to write. Uh, and the contribution part is, is really fun. I, I cannot stress it enough. Is the most that is the most important part of a paper, and therefore this is where you have to invest the you know, the, um, the largest amount of energy, patience. All you can do, all you can give to your paper, or pretty much all. Uh, that's exactly the session in which in which you have to invest pretty much all you have in the contribution. Once that's written, meaning once um, the purpose of the research is written. Once the method that was used is also written, and the results that you have got uh, are also there, then we go uh, to the other parts. Writing an introduction is not that difficult. It, I would say that the main, well, main. Mm, let me think of the words I want to say. The um, maybe one of the most difficult parts of writing an introduction is to choose. Uh, is a is a wise selection of the papers that we would like to mention in the introduction in order to uh, to introduce our own contribution, okay? So um, make sure basically that the papers that you choose uh, to introduce to provide the, the appropriate context uh, that will allow the reader to appreciate the contribution of your paper uh, are the ones that you really need. What I mean by that is if you have to, if you have to uh, say to cite 100 papers, because that's what you think uh, has to be done in order to provide a proper context uh, of you for your contribution, then do that. If you think it's only 20 papers, well, only 20 papers, okay? That's really up to you. And that's, um, you know, the selection of those papers will come out as a result of your experience in the field. Okay? Um, there is no, honestly, there's no, I would say, a standard there as for the number of papers or which papers should be should be cited. Cite those that you think are really, um, um, mm, one, on the one hand, that are really worth in the sense that, you know, that the contribution of those papers uh, deserve, deserves to be mentioned. And also, the, the contribution of those papers will allow the reader uh, to realize how important the contribution is. Okay? As for conclusions, it's basically uh, a summary of the results okay, that, that you got. And, um, and it's also a good idea, in my opinion, to provide in the conclusions a bit of a context of the, uh, of the relative place that your contribution has in the whole uh, scenario of the scientific field that you're working in. Okay? Why is it that the contribution was important? Uh, because it advanced the field in this or that way. That is to be provided to be uh, written succinctly in the conclusion. Okay? And finally, a question that uh, manager has, which is, uh, how to make a compelling and impactful abstract. I, that's a very difficult thing to do. And that's a question which is hard to answer, but I'll do my best to do that. Um, an abstract, as I would say, there are some rules that have to be followed uh, when writing an abstract. The first rule is that um, we should try to avoid, although sometimes it's pretty much impossible, but only sometimes, we should try to avoid having references in the abstract. Uh, meaning uh, asking the reader to read other paper you know, from the very abstract in order to understand what our contribution is. That's not a good idea because they shall not do it. Okay? An abstract has to be a summary, a very concise summary of the contribution of our, of our paper. That's what the abstract is about. And basically the role that the abstract plays um, in scientific publishing is that of being the five, four, six, seven lines that will make a reader go for the whole paper. See, so that's the objective. The objective, I mean, um, in terms of our communicating science is to provide a succinct um, uh, presentation uh, of our contribution, uh, to be able to communicate the main uh, idea, the main contribution of our paper in just a few lines, six, seven lines, okay? Maybe more, maybe less, less, maybe it's a bit too less, okay? Seven, 10 lines, but certainly nothing like two pages, okay? It has to be succinct. Um, and it also has to be written, uh, say, I will say in layman, in layman terms, but certainly trying to be, trying to be, sorry, very clear uh, without uh, an excessive use of technical words. 
Yeah? Because the point again is uh, to communicate science in a very clear and concise manner. So that's our, the first goal. And the second, which is, I would say, pretty much the same in terms of, of importance, is that the abstract for a reader shall be the piece of that paper that he or she will read. And that if that if the, if the abstract is good enough, as you, as you say, if it is compelling, right, then we shall know that because the reader shall be willing to invest more time in reading the whole paper. Okay, so now there is no uh, definite metric, so to speak, uh, to measure how good an abstract is. That's something that comes together with time and experience and expertise. Um, that's the way it is. And sometimes even system scientists write not that good abstracts. And sometimes students, even undergrad students, can write fantastic abstracts. I think that. That really depends on on how um, say how clear the contribution that one has produced is in our heads, how good we are at communicating science without using um, many technical or scientific words or terms, and our capacity to translate um, equations or mathematical notation, mathematical language into plain words. That that would be my answer. It's um it's really an art to write with abstracts. Um, and I would say that this is one of the I mean the, how hard it is to write abstracts um, and to communicate basically efficiently the main ideas or the main contributions of a of a paper. Uh, <coughs> oh, sorry, hold on one second please. <coughs> sorry but I my, my dog is barking. <laughs> Sorry. So I just knocked into the door. So the door. Hold on, please. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, uh, sorry, I, I was saying that, uh, I mean, in addition to, to writing uh, uh, good abstracts, there are now a number of tools that come together with technology that, with, that can be used, you know, to invite others, to, to invite the scientific community to, uh, to read our papers. For example, video clips. Uh, these videos that uh, Yeko was mentioning yesterday, uh, the editor in, editor in, in chief, sorry, of QIP, my boss there, um, is also another method that we can use for, you know, for inviting people to read our our work. Okay. Well, um, there are no more questions. Well, now we're just about to finish because we're uh, uh, it's uh, eleven to ten for me. But let me get to the other part of writing a paper, which is uh, maybe the most frustrating part, which is the one that comes once we have finished writing our paper. So, well, now the paper, in our opinion, is ready to be submitted to a scientific journal. Well, and I'm making a pause here because I want to stress the fact that this is something to be taken very seriously and with a lot of patience. Seriously, not in the sense that our life depends on publishing a paper. To be honest, uh, the life of a scientist, um, of course, publish or perish is still a big thing, and will be most likely for you know, uh, um, for anyone who's serious about uh, uh, um, science as a profession. Um, but we also have to take into account that um, that what we do as scientists, um, the impact that we can have in our society, of course, that impact is uh, is composed of uh, quite an important component of that impact is what we write and what we publish. But it's not necessarily the most, say, the only thing that matters in our lives, in our scientific life, in our life as, as scientists. Let me be concrete about this. The, the peer review process is a very difficult, complex, and sometimes random process in, in the life of a scientist. What do I mean by that? Peer review, uh, which is something that we should really talk about in another, uh, in another lecture, because that can, we can talk about it for hours. But peer review is basically the process of uh, submitting a paper uh, to the analysis of other scientists who will put I who will, uh, and by reading it, you know, making questions uh, based on the paper, shall have a 
shall produce a set of criticisms, okay, that in principle um, would allow you know the author or the authors of that paper to improve the scientific content and the clarity of the ideas that are presented in that paper. And then if the peer review process, meaning if the if the peers who are reviewing the, the, the paper um, uh, think that the, that the questions and the criticisms that have been posed by them have been fully satisfied or at least sufficiently satisfied, then it's very likely that the peers who review that paper um, give a go ahead and say, well, yeah, this paper uh, is recommended to be published. Okay? We recommend this paper to be published. But that process um, is very complex because human nature plays a big role there because the um, because of the amount of time and energy that peers have to invest in reviewing a paper. Uh, sometimes it's happened to me. Uh, sometimes I, I really do have time to review a paper and then I do what I think is a, is a good job. Sometimes I really have no time to do a proper job and then I have to make a decision either making a poor review or taking longer you know, for, uh, for being able to process the ideas and the criticisms that I have in mind, that I want to, but that I have to write down, I have to put it in black and white, and that takes time. So um, the choice of, uh, in my case, I always choose to um, uh, to take longer, uh, but the trouble is that the author is waiting, you see? and uh, and the peer review process can take months. That's uh, well, it sometimes takes years, but uh, it usually takes months. So as an author, as a scientist who's sharing his uh, his or her knowledge. Uh, with the scientific community and public in general, uh, that process of waiting for months for uh, peers uh, to do the review and then for the for the editor to get back to the author or the authors to uh, uh, to share with them the criticisms that were produced by the uh, by the peers, um, that's a process that one really has to take with the patience of a monk. So take it easy. Okay? That's really my advice there. Submit your paper and then start working or keep working in parallel in other projects so so that you know, that uh, the concerns that you may have about your paper being reviewed by someone else and why is it taking for so long, well, that's just the nature of the process as it stands now. Um, so chill out, take it easy, keep on working on other things and wait for the reviewers to do their job and for the editor to do his or her job too. Okay? Of course, if it's taken more, for example, it happened to me with a paper um, uh, a few years ago, we, uh, we submitted, to a, submitted it to a journal, and then after nine months, uh, the paper uh, hadn't even been, uh, I mean, not even the first round had been produced, right? that is to say, the paper had not been assigned to reviewers who had actually produced you know, um, a series of criticisms. So and I contacted the uh, the editor and asked him or her, so I don't know the, um, the gender, but I asked him or her, um, why was it taking so long? And the editor never replied. So after pretty much close to a year, uh, I spoke to my colleagues who were co-authors of the paper, and we decided to uh, to withdraw that paper from that journal and to submit it to another, to another journal. Okay? Um, that's frustrating, that's very frustrating, but that's just part of being a scientist. Okay? So, easy, don't let that have an impact on your, uh, on your mental health, honestly, okay? uh, on your uh, commitment to do science. That's just the way it is. It's not the best part of doing science, but that's part of being a scientist. You see, we all, in any profession, um, we have to do what we have to do, and sometimes what we have to do is great. Some other times what we have to do it's not exactly what we love, but that's the way it is. That's just part of the, of the very nature of the job that we chose or the profession that we chose. So you just have to live with it, okay? There was one more question over there. Hold on, please. It says, Professor, hello, Diego, how are you doing? I recommend you to write in science, how to write papers that get cited and proposals that get funded by Joshua Sh Scheimer, I suppose it's pronounced, pronounced, and choose scientific writing and communication papers, proposals, and presentations by Angelica H. Hoffman. Well, two fantastic recommendations coming from one of the best scientific writers that I know, uh, that I am, uh, that I been privileged to work with, uh, Professor Diego Santiago Alarcón. Thank you very much, Diego. I appreciate it. 
Okay. Well, um, so that's that's it. Uh, well, ju we're just about to finish. It's uh, four to ten to me. Um, so let me leave uh, uh, leave you with this. Uh, uh, say with a few thoughts. Uh, uh, try to summarize uh, what we talked about today. A um, writing science uh, requires a very deep and thoughtful process that begins with having a good scientific idea that we would like to explore uh, by means of a strategy that comes together, remember this, comes together in parallel with implementation of that strategy. How exactly am I going to get the resources, the money, the people I need in order to do what I want to do, which is to go from that scientific idea or that idea that I have into something that is worth, into a discovery that is worth communicating. That's one thing. Two, work on it. Uh, bear in mind that we scientists work with the unknown. I know that sounds uh, kind of uh, the twilight zone, but that's true. We work with something that, with things that people don't know. We're basically, you know, um, we're the ones who are creating the paths that some other people will walk after us. So, you know, creating those paths sometimes will take us, you know, to end roads. Um, sometimes it will take us to, to great discoveries. But keep in mind that sometimes we just have ideas that we think they're going to be great discoveries and they happen not to be that great or simply they will just grow. Okay? So we have to learn we live with that, to live with that you know, and to keep on going. Okay? To keep on going. That's very important. Uh, no matter how many failures we have, um, there will always be one, one, one good idea that shall will allow, that, will, that shall make our, our lives as scientists um, uh, plentiful. Okay, so keep working, uh, even though you will find these obstacles in the process. And then once you, get, I mean, if you get to the happy, to the very happy uh, uh, point of um, having something worth communicating, then start writing the paper. Choose your strategy. I mean, uh, explore. Um, um, find out by yourself what's the best method for you to write. What I do, as I said, is I begin with a contribution because this is part that takes the longest. And that's also because I want to make sure that this is perfectly clear, not only to me, but I also actually share it with, uh, with several colleagues so that they give me their opinion as to whether what I've written is good enough or not. Meaning clear enough, concise enough, and so to speak, scientific enough, meaning rigorous enough, okay? So once I've done that, I go for the introduction, the conclusions, all the other stuff. Abstract, the abstract is a summary of the contribution that we are presenting in that paper. And that summary, um, has to be, of course, concise, has to be clear. Try to keep the technical words as in just as few as possible. I mean, try to explain what, you're, what you want to say in plain words, but at the same time, be concise. That's very difficult to achieve, and that's why abstracts, uh, writing abstracts is, is quite an art, okay? But that comes with experience, and you will eventually get better. And once you're done with the paper, let's say once you have a, a draft that it's worth uh, being sent to a journal, uh, submitted to a journal, do it, and remember, the peer review process is lengthy. The peer review process is frustrating many times. Some other times it is not. For example, a paper that Diego and I wrote um, back in 20, 2019, that was published in 2020, the peer review uh, process that we had was fantastic, honestly. It was, a, it was really great. Diego and I talked about it uh, for well, quite a long time, remember Diego? Because, uh, well, that, that was really nice, the, the, you know, the reviews that we got. But sometimes we get the opposite. You know? Sometimes we get reviews that we may think, well, come on, it makes no sense at all. It's clear that the reviewer didn't read the paper. That happens, okay? So we have to learn to live with that, to get the best out of it, okay? Maybe to learn, when we get poor reviews, to learn how to be, to learn what we shouldn't do to others, and therefore to become good reviewers, okay? um, by learning, you know, by the opposite, you know, by the other extreme. And, um, and that's pretty much what it is. I wish you all the best. Best of luck in writing your papers. And of course, uh, feel free to get in touch with me if you have uh, uh, doubts about this process that I can contribute towards um, answering them. All right. Thank you very much. I see no more questions here. So I'm done. Um, I don't know. I just saw Araceli. I think she was around. I'm Manino. Pardon. How are you? Thank you so much, Salvador. It was really really great to know all these tactics to write the scientific paper. I know I have been there at that position when I didn't know anything about how to write a paper. 
and how to get to to the end like to publish it the first paper was always a big tackle for you but when 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 once paper is uh, paper is published then it's it becomes easier for you to understand like this is how you can do it and thank you so much for all these sort of suggestions i really do, i'm sure everybody must have uh, uh, learned a lot from you today and now it's time for our next session mm -hmm. thank um, you very much bye, -bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, Salvador. And I request all the attendees to join our next session, the Women Panel session. Thank you.